Welcome to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. The show covering all things health, wellness, culture, and more. The show for all of us who aren't old, we're better. Each week, we'll interview superstars, experts, and ordinary people doing extraordinary things, all related to this wonderful experience of getting better, not just older. Now, here's your host, the award-winning Paul Vogelzang. Welcome to a riveting episode of the Not Old Better Show Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. I'm Paul Vogelzang, and I'm a dog person. (laughs) If you're a dog person, your dog is not just a pet. They are a cherished member of your family. Yet the depth of this bond might be even more profound than you realize. Today, we delve into the heart of of the human canine connection guided by the insights of our guests today, Smithsonian Associates, Jen Golbeck and Stacey Colino, authors of the new book, The Purest Bond, Understanding the Human Canine Connection. Today, we will hear from Jen Golbeck and Stacey Colino as they unveil the myriad ways our furry companions enrich our lives beyond the joy of their wagging tails and comforting presence. From bolstering our physical health to enhancing our emotional resilience, the impact of dogs on our well-being is both vast and deeply reciprocal. I think you need to be prepared today to explore the science and the stories behind this special relationship. You will discover how dogs not only receive our love, but return it in measures beyond our understanding. This episode promises to deepen your appreciation for our four-legged friends, revealing the true extent of the love they offer and the remarkable ways they improve our lives. Join us as we uncover the purest bond, one that makes our lives richer, healthier, happier, and infinitely more meaningful. Both Stacy Colino and Jen Goldbeck have agreed to read brief passages from their new book, The Purest Bond, Understanding the Human Canine Connection. And let's listen to those now. My passage is going to come from our last chapter called Lessons from Our Dogs. And I think it's a really good summation emotionally of everything that's in the book. From the day we bring a dog home, whether they enthusiastically bound through the door or cry throughout their first night, we begin to forge this purest bond. If we're lucky, We'll spend more than a decade learning about their quirks and how to make them happy. We'll learn about the weird snacks they like. Maybe you get a dog who steals whole heads of iceberg lettuce off the counter or who craves tater tots and the games they like to play. We will comfort them through fireworks and thunderstorms, injuries and illnesses, and the taunts of squirrels in the yard. And we will take them on adventures, whether it's camping in the wilderness, road trips across the country, or a daily outing to that weirdly but consistently intriguing patch of grass one block over. Eventually, our dogs will slow down. We will massage their backs and hips and buy them orthopedic beds, cook them dinner, and feed it to them by hand. And eventually, in exchange for their lifetime of good days, we will endure one of our worst when we have to say goodbye. It will be painful to do, but we know that giving them a gentle, loving send-off is a profound responsibility and the last great kindness we can do for them. And even though we will be left with a permanent crack in our hearts, we won't spend one minute regretting that we loved them so completely. I have heard Jen read that out loud probably six times now, and I get teary every time. All right. Well, I'm going to take us back in time in terms of this purest of bonds and read a passage from a chapter called The Birth of a Bond. The Birth of a Bond. Choosing a dog is a bit like speed dating or an arranged marriage. Even when you know what qualities you're looking for in a pup, perhaps friendliness, playfulness, affection, loyalty, intelligence, a certain energy level, and the like, it's hard to gauge all this when you first meet a dog. And it may or may not be love at first sight. As with human relationships, there's often an element of chemistry at play in the dynamic between you. You may feel an instant connection or have a hunch that you'll hit it off or not. Or you may end up simply taking a leap of faith that you will eventually forge the bond you want to have with a particular dog. And sometimes you don't even have the chance to meet the dog ahead of time, in which case it's a total crapshoot. 
When my family was looking to adopt a new dog in September of 2020, a five-year-old shepherd chocolate lab mix named Sadie caught my eye on the website of a dog rescue group that had been highly recommended by a friend. After applying and getting vetted by the group, I drove down with my family to a horse farm in Virginia where one of the rescue organization's foster mothers lived. After we parked, several dogs came to greet us, including Sadie. The five of us humans immediately started petting and playing with all the dogs as their foster mom told us where they were from, how old they were, and described their personalities. Right away, I was smitten with Sadie, whose warm, intelligent eyes and gorgeous smile lit up the world. Meanwhile, my sons and husband were trying to get my attention saying, how about Mocha or Champion? Or why don't we get two? As the primary dog parent in the family, it was tacitly acknowledged that the decision was ultimately up to me. I wanted one dog, and after spending an hour playing with all the dogs, I was leaning towards Sadie. While the foster mom got the paperwork together, I went to the car to get a bag of special dog treats to give her as a thank you and inadvertently left one of the back doors open. Before anyone realized it, Sadie had jumped in the back seat, lain down, and turned to look at me as if to say, can we go now? That's when I realized we had chosen each other. It has proved to be a stellar match. Our guests today, Smithsonian Associates Jen Goldbeck and Stacy Kalino, have just read brief passages from their new book, The Purest Bond, Understanding the Human Canine Connection. And let's bring them in now. Talk to them about these wonderful four-legged friends and the deep connection and the emotional resilience we get from dogs. Dr. Jen Goldbeck and Stacy Galito, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Oh, well, it's so nice to talk to you. We're getting together on a Friday afternoon talking about your upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation about absolutely one of my favorite subjects. And, and I have to tell you, the cover of your new book, The Purest Bond, with the golden retriever on it is just adorable. I, I need to make sure that my audience goes out, checks out this book, <laughs> he buys it, but just enjoys it. It's going to really sit in our house in a very visible place because the, the cover is just so joyous to look at. Congratulations on this wonderful book. Thank you. That that cover model is my dog, Vinkman, and she is just as joyful in everyday life. She's a real pleasure to have around. <laughs> oh my gosh, such a great picture. Well, as I say, I love dogs. I'm excited to talk to you both about this subject. We're going to talk about your Smithsonian Associates presentation. Why don't we just start there? Tell us a little bit about your upcoming presentation. Get us excited about the purest bond and what you're going to tell us at Smithsonian, and in particular, how you'll use Zoom to engage our audience, because we're all on Zoom these days. We are. So this is one of those things when we started writing the book that was a real issue, which is there's not a lot of happy books out there. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff to be scared of and upset about now. And we started writing this really in the middle of COVID lockdown. And we think what has come out is this joyful, hopeful, happy book looking at a very positive force in our lives. So our hope is to get people to engage with that joy and happiness. So we're going to be sharing a lot of dog pictures, maybe doing some polls to get people connected on Zoom. We really just want to make people dig into what an amazing thing it is that their dogs bring into their lives. One of the things that really intrigued us about this project is most people who have a dog and have a close bond with their dog know they love their dog and know that this is a great thing. But what Jen and I got very excited about was diving into the science about the why. Mm -hmm. What is it that connects us? What is it that makes this bond so rich and healthy for humans in so many different ways, physically, emotionally, socially, you name it. The book is full of that science, and we want people to really appreciate that as well. Stacey, I know a little bit about you, and Jen, I know a little bit about you, but you both have real science orientations. I thought as I was reading the book, The Purest Bond, it's wonderful and it's so upbeat and, and positive, but it is very influenced by science. And I thought that was fantastic. And I wondered if you would just touch on a couple of the studies that you came across that reshaped your view of the human dog relationship, because I think that's going to surprise our audience at Smithsonian. And it surprised me. My favorite one by far is an fMRI study. So these are functional MRIs. 
you may have had one or if you've had a regular MRI, it's kind of like that. FMRIs make those pictures of your brain that show the different parts of it that light up in particular situations. One of the things that they did in this book was look at essentially whether our dogs love us back. We know from lots of scientific studies and our own experience that we love our dogs, but are our dogs actually able to love us back? And the way that they did that was to look at something called attachment bonds, which we can measure between people. And they're especially studied between infants and their mothers. And we can do studies with infants in an fMRI where they see their mother and we can see certain parts of their brain light up. We can do it with adults when they see their children, the same parts of the brain light up. And researchers did a study where they trained dogs to lie still in an fMRI machine, which itself is super impressive, (laughs) and showed them their owners, let them smell their owners, let them see them, and looked at what parts of the dog's brain lit up. And it was all the same structures that light up in people when they see these attachment bonds, the very closest relationships that they have. And so what that shows us is that on a neurological level, whatever you want to call love scientifically... We know that we experience love and when we do that, certain parts of our brain are activated. And this study shows that in dogs, when they see us, the same parts of their brain activate. So they're experiencing love in their brains the same way that we do as people. And I just thought that was a beautiful result that shows in this kind of sciencey way that like, yeah, our dogs really do love us back. I'm going to piggyback on that because one of my favorite studies has to do with oxytocin, which is often called the love hormone, the cuddle hormone, or the bonding hormone. So people get a big surge of oxytocin when they hug a loved one. Mothers get it when they snuggle with their babies or when they breastfeed. And it turns out that people and their dogs both get a big spike in oxytocin release when they look into each other's eyes or when people are petting their dogs. It's simultaneous and it's mutual. So that's another example of just how biologically based this love and connection is. It's so amazing. I found in my research of you and in anticipation of our conversation and reading The Purest Bond, I found another study that during particular presentations that we make or perhaps tests that we take as humans, that when we are accompanied to one of those presentations or one of those tests by a friend or a loved one, it doesn't matter as much as having the presence of a dog, how that helps us psychologically and emotionally. And I thought that was just fascinating. Either of you want to comment on that type of test? A really interesting part of that study is they're measuring blood pressure, heart rate, all of these biological indicators of stress. And it's just so funny if you have your spouse with you that they don't do as good a job as calming you down as having your dog with you. (laughs) I thought the same thing. Yeah. (laughs) Dogs in particular, they improve our mental acuity. They give us focus. That's so important for our older adult audience. I'm sure you agree. Have you found that in terms of research too? One theme that really emerged as we were working on the book was that there's a few key ways that dogs help us be better in all of these ways, our physical, our emotional, our psychological health. And one of those things that they do is what we call behavioral activation in psychology. And that just basically means, say you have a depressed person, they don't want to get out of bed. What therapists will work with them on is behavioral activation, which is like, let's pick something that you really like And could you just get out of bed for that? And it could be like having a donut in the morning. It could be going ice skating. Just pick something that's going to make you really happy. Could we get you to do that one thing? And when you do it, hopefully you enjoy it. And then it's a little easier to get up and do it the next day. And that makes it easier to get up and do other things. And you don't have to be depressed to need help with behavioral activation. I have lots of nights where I'm on the couch and I don't want to get up to do anything and it'd be good to. But dogs are really good at giving us that behavioral activation. They're a reason that we need to go out to take them for walks, to let them go to the bathroom and it gets us outside and it gets us moving. And that's something that we all are biologically generally feel better when we go for a walk and get outside. And so if you're looking at you know, especially at older adults who may be having problems with behavioral activation, either their social circles aren't as big, they may have chronic pain that makes it more difficult. Dogs serve as that little spark that you need to get out and do things that make you happier. And that in turn keeps you engaged with the world. It keeps you more mentally sharp. 
I mean, it keeps you experiencing new things, which we know are all really important. On top of that, having a dog, especially as you get older, if you're retired, for example, gives your day some structure. You have a plan for the day, whether it's the morning feeding and then going for a walk or playtime, the same thing in the evening, dinner and a walk. And studies have found that older adults who have dogs really appreciate that, that it gives them a sense of purpose and also a sense of structure to their day. I want to take this also in a little bit of a different direction because there have been some studies that have found that having a dog present is really helpful for people with dementia and Alzheimer's and kind of helps bring them out of themselves, even in assisted living or memory care centers. I find that fascinating. And on a personal level, I've had a couple of friends whose older parents have had various forms of dementia And there were times when they went to visit with their dog, one was a father and one was a mother, the parent didn't recognize them, but they knew the dog and they knew the dog's name. And so the presence of a dog can sort of unlock certain aspects of cognitive function that may not be 100% there otherwise. Hi, it's Paul. Do you love entertaining, informative, eclectic, insightful programs about culture, health, science, life, and everything Smithsonian? As part of our Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast, we're introducing you to the new Smithsonian Associates streaming series. Smithsonian, a nonprofit organization, is excited to present this new aspect of their 55 years as the world's largest museum-based educational program. Join us from the comfort of your home as we periodically interview Smithsonian Associate guest speakers. Our audience here on radio and podcast can explore our website for more information, links, and details at notold-better.com. Thanks, everybody. Our guests today are Smithsonian Associates, Dr. Jed Goldbeck and Stacey Colino. Jen and Stacey have written the wonderful new book, The Purest Bond. It's fantastic. I can't recommend it enough to our audience. I'm not the older one. The, The book is getting rave reviews online. Blair Braverman, the author of Dogs on the Trail, says, a loving examination of all the ways that dogs help people thrive with wisdom about helping your dog thrive too. Jen and Stacy are the perfect people to write this book. I love that. I thought that that really says so much. And I want to talk to you about something that you referred to earlier, and that's the pandemic and COVID and in particular isolation, because that's something that is part of Those of us who are over age 60, we're facing that, and we definitely face that during COVID-19. Dogs, the human-canine relationship, can overcome some of that feeling of isolation, that feeling of, of loneliness. And you have found in your research that, and it's spelled out very nicely in the book, that in fact, dogs can facilitate much of that. And I thought it was really interesting to learn about how dogs and humans can build community connections, can aid social interactions, and can offer this kind of community cohesion. I think that's wonderful, especially in these times when so many of us are alone. But when we're out and about, dogs help us meet people, and they do a great job of that. This is one of my favorite results that we found when we were doing the research for the book. You know, when I was dating... I would often do coffee dates and bring my dogs with because you never have the awkward silences of like, what are we going to talk about now? You can always talk about the dogs. It was a good strategy. They could also protect me if it went bad, I guess. (laughs) Uh, One of my favorite studies from the book, we found that if you look at neighborhoods and how many dogs are in the neighborhood, that if there's more dogs, the neighborhood tends to be more cohesive, have a greater sense of civic responsibility. People tend to have positive attitudes about their neighbors, even the people who don't have dogs. Just the presence of more dogs in the neighborhood makes that better. And the reason we think that is, is because Obviously, people are out walking their dogs. They're having positive interactions through the dogs. You kind of get to know your neighbors even by sight if you don't talk to them, if they're just walking past on that same routine walk every day. So they're able to bring entire communities together, again, even if people don't have dogs. I thought that was a beautiful result, that it's not just the people who live with these creatures that are getting the benefit. It's this whole bigger social impact that they have. Mm Mm-hmm all of us benefit by having 
this opportunity to be out and about with one another. And dogs really can act as you know, just a nice entree into each other's lives. I thought that was wonderful. Well, Stacey knows about that quite specifically. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, Stacey. Well, I met my second husband walking dogs. In <laughs> Congrats. Thank you. Um, We've been together for what, like 11 years now, but he lived around the corner and he had two dogs. I had one. Our dogs didn't get along, but we would always stop and chat, even from 10 feet apart on the sidewalk or across the street. And um, he was married at the time. I was married and his marriage fell apart before mine did. But by the time mine did, I kept the dog and I had a lot more dog walking to do and we got (laughs) to know each other better. I like to say that my former dog, Inky, brought us together. (laughs) Good for Inky. That's so nice. What a great story. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah. Well, and my best to you. I mean, I think that's just a great example. My wife and I have had dogs throughout our marriage. We've been married 36 years, 36 years now, and have always loved them. But as we've gotten older, there are just more challenges involved with having a young dog in the household. And we have that. Right now in our household, we have a puppy. And I wonder if you'd talk, both of you, about some of the challenges that that we face as older adults as we bring these dogs into our homes and what solutions you might recommend to make sure that we can do it in a way that makes for a wonderful household for us, but also for the dog. One thing that's really helpful is to learn to really pay attention to your dog and what they need. So we rescue golden retrievers, though I also Mm -hmm. have a nine, 10 week old puppy right now. So I'm in the same, <laughs> same spot as you. She's not our, our normal intake. Uh, so whether it's with a puppy or with a rescue dog who may be for us nine or 10 years old and come from a really traumatic background, we like to bring them in and really allow them the space that they need. Sometimes we've had dogs that hide under the living room table and won't come out for two weeks. You know, we can barely get them to come out to eat or go outside. But if we were to drag them out and force them to interact, that's just going to scare them. When I brought this puppy home, I think she was terrified to not be with her litter mates anymore. And she literally like tried to sleep on top of my face. You know, she just wanted like a warm, (laughs) I couldn't breathe. I was like, if I'm going to die, this could be the best way to go. Uh, But she wanted to be, you know, touching me on top of me, you know, Mm -hmm. hand in her mouth all the time. So she was really the opposite of that. But allowing them to tell you what they need and really listening to that, not pushing them to do things that are scary until they get adapted to your house to really learn that like this is a safe place it's a place you know, they wouldn't use these words but you know where their boundaries are respected where when they show you what they need you listen that's so important and if you do that right at the beginning it lays that groundwork for having a really good bond and a, a trusting close relationship for all the years you have ahead In addition to everything that Jen said, which I 100% agree with, with older adults, and Jen has experienced the fallout or the repercussions from this firsthand, sometimes people get very excited about adopting a puppy or buying a puppy. In some cases, they may not have thought through what that energy level is going to look like and what is going to be required of them to manage it. Jen has had experiences, I'll let her tell about this, where older adults have gotten a puppy and, you know, puppies are adorable. We all love them. But they suddenly realized, ooh, we are not quite up for this. And that happened recently with one of Jen's dogs. In addition to this 10-week-old puppy, we also have one who's about 10 months old now who came to us in exactly that way. So they're going to be best friends and it's great. But man, is that tough to to take in a puppy and have a dog you think you're going to have for over a decade and then realize a few days in that this is a whole energy level that you'd forgotten about and can't manage. The good news is there's dogs for everybody out there. Whatever your abilities are, your needs are, your energy level and physical abilities are, there's a dog that you can bring into your life that's going to fit. I'm going to touch on the golden ratio because this ties a little bit in. You mentioned some of the rescue work that you do, and you do work with the golden ratio. I believe it's the golden ratio foundation. Am I right about that? That's right. So the golden ratio Mm -hmm. is our dog social media account. And then Mm -hmm. the foundation, we started out of that to help support dogs. Gotcha. And golden comes from golden retrievers, but you work with lots of different dogs and dog owners 
That's right. So we take in golden retrievers and we had a Labradoodle sneak in once. <laughs> and then the foundation helps support sometimes individual dogs. So this year we've supported medical care for one senior who we had fostered, training for another dog who had not come through our house. But we also do things like support medical research into dog conditions. We lost one dog to epilepsy. And so the foundation made a donation to support epilepsy research in dogs. Also the Morris Animal Foundation, they're running a project now called the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. We've had two dogs in that. One of them passed in June, but the other one's still with us. They entered that study when they were six months old and have done annual checkups and surveys and all kinds of fun science for their whole lives. 3,000 dogs are participating and their goal is to understand the origins of cancer in dogs. It's going to be really transformative. So the foundation will support them as well. Well, it just sounds fantastic. We'll put links so that our audience can find out more information about the golden ratio, as well as information about Jen Goldbeck and Stacey Colino in their new book, The Purest Bond, as well as their upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation. Again, Jen, Stacey, it's such a joy to talk to you both and congrats on this book and all that you're doing. I know you're both very busy. We really just have one final question for you. And it's about the process of collaboration on a book like this. What was that like? Maybe tell us a couple of stories and experiences that came together that brought you together in writing The Purest Bond. And I got to know, were dogs in the room the, the whole time with you <laughs> as you were brainstorming and, and collaborating? I had started on this project by myself and written a couple sample chapters and sent them to my agent. The agent was like, have you considered working with a professional writer to help you with this? And I was like, oh, my ego is really hurt. Like I thought I was pretty good at this. But then I was like, that's actually such a great idea. I had never written a book for a non-technical audience before. They did some kind of writer speed dating sort of thing. And <laughs> Stacy and I that's met. Uh, her dog was in the room. I think I probably had a couple dogs in the room at a time. And we just clicked right away. And I I think the whole process has been really joyful. We've become good friends through the process. And yeah, our dog sat with us the whole time. Yeah, it was great fun working together. I, I think so, Stacey. I think so too, 100%. <laughs> we really have very compatible work styles. And then in the ways that we're different, we complement each other. So it really was a labor of love to do this book. And it was so much fun that we're going to do another one together. Oh, good. Love it. We love each other's dogs too. When Jen's in town, sometimes she comes over for a visitor for dinner and my dog Sadie just adores her. I love and her back. You guys really get along so well. And I love Jen's dogs too. Well, again, congratulations. And so nice to talk to you both. This is a fantastic subject. I'll just say selfishly, I'd love to have you both come back and talk to us about your, your upcoming work and Please keep me posted, and certainly I'll be following up. Jen Goldbeck, Stacy Colino, Smithsonian Associates has been our guest today. Check out our show notes for more details about their wonderful book, The Purest Bond. you got to check out the cover of this book, everybody. It'll make you smile, and I agree with you both. We do need to smile these days. So have a great rest of your day. Have a great weekend. I look forward to seeing you at Smithsonian Associates, but thanks so much for your time and for reading, too, from your book. That's so generous of you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Paul. My thanks to Smithsonian Associates, Jen Goldbeck and Stacey Colino, co-authors of the new book, The Purest Bond, Understanding the Human Canine Connection. Please check out our show notes today for more details. My thanks to the Smithsonian team for all they do to support the show. My thanks to you, our wonderful audience here on radio and podcast. And my thanks always to executive producer Sam Hanniger for all his work on the show. Please, everybody, be well, be safe, and let's talk about better. The Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. Thanks, everybody. We will see you next week. Thanks for joining us this week on the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. To find out more about all of today's stories or to view our extensive back catalog of previous shows, simply visit notold-better.com. Join us again next time as we deep dive into some of the most fascinating real-life stories from across the world, all focused on this wonderful experience of getting better, not just older.
Let's talk about better the not old better show. I one final thing. Please check out our website for this episode and all episodes at not old better.com or subscribe to the podcast on Apple podcast and be sure to check out your local radio stations to find out more about the not old better show on podcast and radio. You can find us all over social media. Our Twitter feed is not old better. And we're on Instagram at not old better Too, the not old better show is a production of NOBS studios. I'm Paul Vogel saying, and I hope you'll join me again next time to talk about better. The Not Old Better Show. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week.